Welcome back in business. Running a business is hard work. It takes long hours, dedication, and can stress you beyond belief. Unfortunately, it does take its toll on relationships along the way. So what do you do when a divorce or breakup affects your business? That's where Andrew Feldstein comes into the picture. Andrew is the principal in the Feldstein Family Law Group, and he is with us to discuss how to cope with divorce and the effects on your business. If you would like to ask a question, make a comment, or join the conversation, you can call us at 905-848-5483. That's 905-848-LIVE. Or you can tweet your question to at David Wojcik or use the hashtag RTV in business. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks for coming back. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, we've, uh, we've talked about divorce and business and, and how it, it, it doesn't mix. What is, uh, when it comes to, to, to business and divorce, are you seeing an escalation in, in separation and divorce with people that are self-employed and in business for themselves? Well, we see a lot of uh, people who are self-employed going through separation or divorce, and it's obviously a very hard time for them. Because of the fact they're self-employed, their case is more complex than someone who is an employee at another company. Okay, so give us some of the examples of what would be, uh, what would be some of the more complex situations that would arise in a situation where somebody's self-employed? Well, two of the issues deal with, or I should say one of the issues is the valuation of the business. If you're self-employed, mm -hmm. what is your business worth? Right. How do you determine that? You have to hire a business valuator to tell you how much it's worth. Are you going to do it together? Are you going to do it on your own? How detailed should the valuator look? Is it a forensic type of analysis? Or are they accepting your numbers? Right. And that's incredibly stressful when you're a business owner having to find out what your business is worth. And ironically, it's one time in your life you're hoping your business isn't worth that much. Because <laughs> it, it, uh, it keeps it down. And, and if it's somebody that's going through valuating the business, they're picking through everything that's they, going on in the business. They may pick through everything, they may not. It depends on the scope of review that you have them looking at. Uh -huh. uh, obviously, the more they look at, the more expensive it is. And valuations of a business are very expensive. Right. Okay. And what are some of the other things that are intrinsic to, uh, to self-employed individuals? Well, one of the other challenges is that if you're separated and you have kids, you may have to pay child support if the kids are with your spouse and you may have to pay spousal support. Mm -hmm. and so when you pay child support and spousal support, it's based on your income and your spouse's income. If you're an employee for somebody else, you can look at their T4 and you know what their income is. Pretty straightforward. But when you're self-employed, what is your income and how you determine it? And again, there can be allegations that uh, require a business valuator slash chartered accountant to come in and give a report as to what your income is because one party is going to say you're writing off a bunch of business expenses that right. are really personal, personal in nature yeah. or you're doing a cash business or part of your business is cash and you're not declaring it. So your spouse wants to drive your income up as high as you can and you want to keep it down. And it's very stressful as a business owner because if your business isn't doing as well as you think it is, your, your spouse's immediate reaction is to say, are you telling me the truth or are you just doing this to reduce your support? Right. And, and when it comes to things like that, when, they, when the allegations start flying about cash business, I'm sure the CRA gets, gets the ears up in the air as well, and they want to know, well, why are we not getting our pound of flesh out of this, which can create a whole other situation. Well, that's if CRA finds out. <laughs> and that's where are you suggesting that a spouse has never picked up the phone and called CRA and said hey I'm going through a divorce and my spouse has got some cash going on the side it's actually a really foolish thing for the spouse to do okay because if you're able to establish that your spouse has cash the child support guidelines say well we're gonna add that cash in but we're also gonna gross it up to reflect what somebody who would get, who would be an employee, would have mm. to earn to make it. So what I mean by that is, if somebody does $50,000 of cash, and it would take them, if they were a T4 employee, $100,000 to make to net 50, when we determine what that person's income is, we're not just adding 50 cash, right. we're adding the 50 for the taxes they would have had to pay too. So now you as, don't want to tell CRA. As a family law practitioner, I'm sure you must feel like a part counselor sometimes when people come in and they start uh, talking about their situations. What are some of the root causes? And I, and I guess you see people on both sides of the fence when you see somebody that is the self-employed individual and someone that's a, the spouse of a self-employed individual. What are the main complaints that you hear about? What's, what's going on there? What's causing the disruption in the first place? Well, 
what I hear from the spouses of the self-employed individuals are that they married somebody who was a certain way when they got married and now they've met with some success in their life. Now that they're becoming successful, they feel like their spouse is treating them as another one of their employees. Oh, okay. All right. The spouse who's self-employed is used to walking in at their office and if they want a cup of coffee, they can tell somebody, get me a cup of coffee. If they want something done, they tell somebody, get it done, and people do it. And, and that's not acceptable at home. <laughs> at home, it's going to get you into trouble. <laughs> um, what is the impact on the business when people are going through a divorce? Uh, how does it affect them? Well, there's a tremendous amount of emotional stress. So one of the issues that happens are, are people becoming obsessed with the separation in of itself. And does that mean if you're a self-employed entrepreneur, you're being distracted from what you should be concentrating on, which is the business? Right. The other problem you face is that the disclosure that can be asked for can be significant. And what do I mean by that is if the spouse of the self-employed person wants to see a whole plethora of documentary information, now the self-employed person is spending all this time putting it together rather than concentrating on the business. Right. Do you, do you find that uh, uh, it, and, and uh, this probably shoots the gamut of, of divorce cases, but is it more common in self-employed situations where they really start nickel and diming over, over some things? And do you set, take them aside and say, look, you, know, you think about the cost of your business and this really isn't worth fighting over. Do you ever have that conversation? That conversation happens all the time with people. Mm -hmm. And it's a really important conversation to bring people back to what can I achieve? Uh, our, our hourly rates are not inexpensive to say the least right. and you have to always look at it and say what am I going to get you for what you're going to have to pay even if I do the best possible job I can and frequently that brings people back to wanting to make compromises. Mm -hmm. So when they look at the cost of, uh, of, of legal advice on both sides and the cost of dragging this thing out sometimes they do come to a rational decision? Well sure sometimes you look at a situation and you say we're fighting about does the spouse make another twenty thousand dollars of income right and if you're looking at it just for child support I'm gonna give you an example and say it's worth three hundred dollars a month right of child support how much are you gonna fight about thirty six hundred dollars a year exactly you don't want to spend much on that you're not gonna spend fifteen twenty grand fighting over that exactly uh, in September you launched it's time for justice tell us about that well I've been doing this almost twenty years now and I find it incredibly frustrating how slow the system is we at Feldstein Family Law Group would prefer to be able to provide a service where we feel it's efficient to the parties who are going through separation. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of papers, written ideas, and it's just become very frustrating to see that the system seems to get worse and not better, despite a lot of people making very good and positive efforts to improve it. So I wanted to launch something where we'd say there are a lot of problems point out what some of the problems are, eventually give what we think are some solutions, but at the same time we would like people to visit our site, it's timeforjustice.ca, and provide their input and comments mm -hmm. and suggestions they have, because perhaps some of the public can have great ideas to come up with to improve this process. Uh, what are some of the uh, inefficiencies or deficiencies that you see? An easy one is, I go to court on something called the case conference. I may wait there three to four to five hours to get 30 minutes in front of a judge. Oh, okay. And my client's paying for me to wait. Right. Why can't I do that by Skype? Right. Or if I have to schedule a court date, and this may shock people, I write a letter to the other side saying, can you give me your available dates? If I'm lucky, they respond to me and they give me their dates. Then I write to the trial coordinator and I say, are any of these dates available? Because we have to give three dates. Then if the trial coordinator says no, you She'll write back and say, again? what about these dates? And then i got to write this letter all over again. <laughs> so you can go through a lot of money being spent on scheduling a date. Right. In the 21st century, why there isn't a calendar that I can't enter into with some sort of security codes and simply put down the date I want, it fires off an email directly to the other side who says, this, these are the dates Feldstein selected. Do you want one of them done? Fraction of the price. Yeah. And it seems so easy, and, and, and we know there is technology out there for the, for the average person to use where you, you can see a calendar, you can see the dates, you can see what's, uh, what's going on there, so it would make sense. I mean, why is it every document has to be filed where we have to send somebody down to the courthouse to file it? For that same case conference date, once they give us the date, right. we then have to do a case conference notice, which we take to the courthouse to get the court stamp, then serve it on the other side, prepare an affidavit of service, and file it with the court. 
So a lot of stuff could be either streamlined or just eliminated altogether. Absolutely. Or electronic filing of documents would make a lot of sense as well. It would. I yeah. find it amazing that we can have uh, businesses like mine that are paperless, but yet the government can create a paperless system for the courthouse. And instead, when you go to court, yeah. you frequently have lost documents. Best of luck to you. Thanks, Andrew, for coming in.